Is it possible that there exists an ancient mystery that holds the secret of America's future? With signs from ancient times which have now appeared on American soil, a mystery over 2,500 years old that concerns the future of every American and the future of America itself. So specific that it foretells the actions of American leaders before they take them and the words of American leaders before they utter them. An ancient mystery that pinpoints the exact date and hours of the collapse of Wall Street. A mystery of nine harbingers. The prophetic signs that appeared in the last days of an ancient kingdom warning of destruction. Now reappearing on American soil, some in New York City, some in Washington, D.C., some in the form of objects, some in the form of ceremonies, some involving American leaders, even the highest in the land, the sign of the sycamore, the stone of judgment, the ancient words that led to the destruction of an ancient nation, now pronounced on America by a major American leader, a mystery that goes back to the sands of Sinai, which has transformed the American economy and the bank account of every American. America's mystery ground and the prophetic warning it holds. Is God sending a warning to America? Is America in danger of national judgment? And is this mystery contained in a book called The Harbinger? The Harbinger, a book of revelations, ancient mysteries manifesting before our eyes. It has become one of the most influential books in modern culture, causing a stir in Christianity, and yet written by a Jewish man, Jonathan Kahn. A book which the week of its release became a New York Times bestseller, becoming one of the longest running bestsellers of its kind. A book which has the appearance of fiction on its surface, but which actually contains revelations so stunning that it has changed multitudes of lives and left media personalities and interviewers amazed and speechless. This is a word from the Lord for America. A warning. Yeah. A clear warning. This is just absolutely awesome. This was the Holy Spirit that illuminated this to you. You have brought clarity to it. This is an incredible revelation. Like It's like God's showing his fingerprints. A book and a revelation that has even reached the halls of the United States Congress and touched senators, representatives, famous American leaders, and public figures. Jonathan Kahn, the author of The Harbinger, is with me, and it's one of the most absolutely compelling books that I've read in the last five years, and I was just absolutely stunned. A message that has taken Kahn to the nation's capital to give the keynote address at the presidential inaugural prayer breakfast. The revelations in the Harbinger opened the way for Khan to speak on Capitol Hill at a gathering of leaders and members of Congress. The Harbinger contains an account of the giving and receiving of nine ancient clay seals by a mysterious stranger, each seal containing an ancient mystery that has to be decoded and upon which rests the future of America. The book has caused a stir throughout the nation Many believe it is a message and revelation from God, the Word for our day. What is the Harbinger? The mystery begins over two and a half thousand years ago in the Middle East in the nation of Israel, the Northern Kingdom, a nation founded on the Word of God and consecrated to His purposes. But the people of Israel turned away from their God and began to drive him out of their lives, out of their public square, out of their culture, out of the lives of their children. They rejected his ways. They broke his laws. They replaced him with idols and turned to gods of greed, materialism, and prosperity. What they had once known to be sin, they now promoted as righteousness. They now called evil good and good evil. They descended into the depths of sexual immorality, and as for those who remained faithful to God and who kept His ways, they were now mocked, marginalized, vilified, and ultimately persecuted. And as for their most innocent, they lifted up their children as sacrifices on the altars of Baal and Molech. And God called to them and sent them prophets, but they would not listen. Finally, He allowed something to happen, a shaking, a wake-up call, to call them back, to save them from national destruction. It would be the first harbinger. But there was another nation, 
which had also been founded on the Word of God and dedicated to His ways. And that nation was America. America was conceived for God's purposes. America was dedicated to God's glory from its very beginning by the Puritans. In fact, they saw America as patterned after ancient Israel. And they prayed and they consecrated this land to God's purposes. And America has been blessed more than any other nation in modern times. But as with ancient Israel, America too has turned away from God and driven him out of its public square, its culture, and the lives of its children. As with ancient Israel, they too rejected his ways and broke his laws and replaced him with idols of greed, materialism, and prosperity. What they had once known to be sin, they now promoted as righteousness and called evil good and good evil. They too descended into the depths of sexual immorality. And as for those who remained faithful to God and who kept his ways, they too were now mocked, marginalized, vilified, and ultimately persecuted. And they too lifted up their children to death, millions of them. And as happened to ancient Israel, there would come to America a wake-up call. The first warning. The first harbinger. The harbinger reveals an ancient mystery coming true in modern times and manifesting in real life. It deals with facts and events as relevant as today's headlines, but the mystery is revealed through a narrative. In this, Jonathan Kahn follows the biblical use of story, parables, symbols, narrative, and imagery to bring forth spiritual or prophetic truth. The story focuses on a journalist named Noriel, who encounters a mysterious stranger known only as the Prophet. Their meetings appear to be chance encounters from the observation deck of the Empire State Building to the western terrace of Capitol Hill. In these encounters, the prophet gives Noriel an ancient clay seal. Each seal contains a mystery. Each mystery must be decoded and unlocked. Each mystery contains a message on which rests the future of America. It all begins with their first meeting in New York City as Noriel sits down on a bench overlooking the Hudson River. The Harbinger's first mystery is revealed at Battery Park, New York City, with the giving of a seal bearing the image of a wall with a breach in the middle, a wall broken through. This opens up the mystery of the first Harbinger, the breach. The first harbinger and the first warning sign of national judgment would come in the form of the breach. In the year 732 BC, Israel's hedge of protection was removed. An enemy was allowed to make a strike on the land. The strike was limited, temporary, and contained, one of the blessings God gave to them. It was a wake-up call, a shaking, so that they would turn back to God, that they would change their course and not be destroyed. After the attack was over, they were given a set time of years to return to God, to be restored as a nation, or to enter into judgment. But the people of ancient Israel would not heed the warning or turn back. Instead, they responded with defiance. They made a vow, which appears in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 through 10. The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. So what they're saying is, God, you're not going to humble us. We're not going to come back to you. We're going to continue defying you. We're going to continue driving you out of our lives. Yet we're going to do it with even more Gusto. We're not going to be humbled by this shaking. We're going to rebuild. We're going to make ourselves stronger. This vow of defiance holds the key to the harbingers and would set the course for the nation's judgment when years later, the kingdom of Israel would be wiped off the face of the earth. America was now the nation in rapid departure from God. And so the first warning sign of national judgment, the first harbinger, appears. The breach. The first harbinger appears to America on September 11, 2001, when the nation's hedge of protection is removed. America, for so much of its history, had a sense of invincibility. But on September 11, that all changed. 
The nation's hedge of protection is lifted. A strike is made on the land. As with the strike on ancient Israel, the attack was limited, contained, and then over. It was a wake-up call, but there would be no return to God, no spiritual revival. In fact, in the years since 9-11, America would grow even farther from God, much farther than before. And in the wake of 9-11, America would take the same steps taken by ancient Israel. The ancient judgment drama would be replayed by a modern nation, and the biblical harbingers of a nation under judgment would begin to manifest. The second harbinger is revealed as Noriel encounters the prophet in the Department of Near Eastern Antiquities in the Metropolitan Museum, and Noriel seeks to unlock a seal with the images of a strange-looking ancient people. The mystery of the second harbinger is that of the terrorist. The ancient Assyrians were a brutal people. They are the fathers of terrorism, the use of terror to accomplish a strategic goal. The Assyrians used terror to make entire cities surrender without a fight. They would mutilate their captives and skin people alive to strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. Every terrorist in some way is linked to the ancient Assyrian. So the attack was not just a military strike, but a strike of terror. For the second harbinger to manifest in America, there would have to be a strike of terrorism. Those who are behind 9-11 weren't just soldiers or enemies of America. They were terrorists. They were, in a sense, the children of the Assyrians, the disciples of the ancient Assyrians. They were the modern version of the ancient Assyrians. The ancient Assyrians, they came from the Middle East. The terrorists of 9-11 came from the Middle East as well. When the ancient Assyrians carried out their strike on Israel, they did so in their language. Their language was that of Akkadia. Akkadian has disappeared from the earth, but there is one language in the world today that is the sister language of Akkadian. That language is Arabic. When the attack of 9-11 was carried out, the language was most similar to the same language that was used to carry out the strike on ancient Israel. And when the attack came on ancient Israel, ancient Israel was drawn into a conflict with Assyria. When 9-11 happened, it brought America into a conflict later on in the land of Iraq, the war in Iraq. Iraq is ancient Assyria. So American soldiers were brought to the same land, the very land that planned the attack against ancient Israel. The second harbinger on a nation in danger of judgment is the sign of the terrorist or the sign of the Assyrian. And so, to America, it is manifested on September 11, 2001. Before the revelations can continue, Noriel must find the key that unlocks the rest of the Harbingers. His search takes him to the reading room of the New York Public Library. There, the prophet appears, bearing an ancient parchment with a revelation that will lead to the decoding of the third harbinger. The third harbinger is revealed in the very first words of the ancient vow of defiance. The bricks have fallen. The first and most visible sign of the Assyrian attack was that of fallen bricks. As the people of Israel emerged after the attack, the most tangible sign of the judgment was that of ruins. Fallen buildings, fallen towers, fallen houses. What does it have to do with America? On September 11th, the image that was burned into the hearts of Americans, the most tangible image of 9-11, was that of the falling buildings. It was that of the ruin heaps, the most graphic image of 9-11 in the wake of the calamity was the enormous room heap at Ground Zero that was burned into our collective consciousness. In other words, the bricks have fallen. The same sign that appeared to ancient Israel as the most graphic manifestation of the warning.
The fourth seal bears the image of what appears to be a tower. The seal is unlocked on the observation deck of the Empire State Building as Noriel and the Prophet overlook the New York skyline. The fourth harbinger follows the vow of ancient Israel, but we will rebuild. The words become the center of the defiant vow. The nation of Israel embarks on a campaign to rebuild the fallen buildings. The implication of the vow is that they're going to rebuild bigger and stronger and better than before. They're going to show God and man that they're not going to be humbled. They're coming back stronger. After 9-11, America embarks on a campaign to rebuild. Leaders start saying, we will rebuild, we will rebuild, and we'll rebuild stronger than before. And so they embark on a campaign to rebuild Ground Zero, the place of the destruction. Now, rebuilding isn't wrong. The problem is rebuilding without God it becomes a sign of pride and arrogance. The ancient words of defiance would specifically manifest in the plan to rebuild Ground Zero. The building would take the form of a tower. It would be a symbol of defiance. This would have to be proclaimed soon after the attack from the United States Senate. And I believe that one of the first things we should commit to as a country, with federal help, that underscores our nation's purpose, is to rebuild the towers of the World Trade Center and to show the world that we are not afraid, we are defiant. When you look at the ancient version of the Bible called the Septuagint. This is the first translation made of the Bible. The Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek by rabbis or Jewish sages. When they came to Isaiah 9:10, they did something very interesting. They translated it this way. They said, the bricks have fallen. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower. What happens after 9-11 is a tower literally starts rising up from the ruins of Ground Zero. This tower is the symbol of America. And where did the ancient rabbis get this phrase, come let us build for ourselves a tower? They got it from Genesis 11 that speaks of a very famous tower, the Tower of Babel. And they immediately saw the connection between the Tower of Babel, which is a tower that comes up in pride and defiance of God, and what was going to happen with Isaiah 9:10? The warning comes, the strike comes, and the destruction comes, and they respond with the building of a tower, as in the Tower of Babel. So, the fourth harbinger appears in the land. The tower, the most colossal of all harbingers, and the most colossal sign of defiance ever erected on American soil. In trying to decode the fifth seal, Noriel notices a mountain in the distance which bears the same shape as the image on the clay seal given to him by the prophet. And there, on that mountain, the mystery of the fifth harbinger is revealed. The ancient vow continues with hewn stone. The fifth harbinger is the hewn stone, the stone of judgment. The Hebrew word for hewn stone is gazit which refers to a huge rectangular stone quarried from mountain rock. The stones were used to build stronger buildings than those built of clay bricks. So ancient Israel begins to rebuild what has been destroyed in the attack with hewn stone in place of clay bricks. The Gazit stone becomes another national symbol of defiance. For the fifth harbinger to manifest in America, the stone of judgment would have to appear in America and be linked to 9-11. After 9-11, the people of New York, they go up to the mountains of New York to do a specific act, to quarry out a stone. They quarry out a massive stone. It is a biblical gazit stone. It's a massive rectangular block of stone, 20 tons of stone. And according to the mystery, the stone has to be taken to the ground of destruction. So they take the stone and they bring it to New York City. And they take the stone more specifically and they bring it to ground zero where the bricks had fallen. And they lower the stone onto the pavement of ground zero. 
and they have a ceremony around the stone. They make it into a symbol, a symbol of defiance. And around the stone gather American leaders, the mayor of New York, the governors of New Jersey and New York and others. They all gather around to have this ceremony. And what they do is they pronounce vows of defiance, that this stone will become a symbol that America is going to come back stronger than ever before. Well, an eerie thing. When the governor of New York, when he spoke over the stone, he said, we are laying this stone in the spirit of defiance. The Gazit Stone, the fifth harbinger of a nation in danger of judgment, manifests in America on July 4th, 2004, at the site of 9-11. In a boat in a lake of Central Park, the sixth harbinger is revealed as the prophet reveals the mystery of the sycamore. The sixth harbinger is revealed in the ancient vow. The sycamores have been cut down. The sixth harbinger is the sign of the sycamore. When the ancient Assyrians attacked Israel, they did not only attack the cities, but they ravaged the land, destroying the sycamores throughout the nation. This is a biblical sign of judgment. It happens more than once. In the Psalms, it records that the very first national judgment, that of Egypt, within that judgment was the destruction of the sycamore. For the sixth harbinger to manifest in America, the sign of the sycamore would have to appear and would have to be linked to 9-11. Well, something eerie happens. In the last moments of 9-11, as the last tower is coming crashing to the ground, it sends forth a shockwave. The force of 9-11 strikes an object. The object happens to be there at the corner of Ground Zero, happens to be a tree. What kind of tree? The tree happens to be the sycamore. The people of New York take the sycamore and they put it on display. They make it a symbol. And they call it the Sycamore of Ground Zero. They think it's a great sign to put on display. They have no idea what they're dealing with. The biblical ancient sign of a nation in danger of judgment. The prophet leads Noriel through Central Park. As the two walk, the mystery of the seventh seal and the seventh harbinger is revealed. The ancient vow continues with the seventh harbinger, but we will plant cedars in their place. It's another sign of defiance. The Israelites vow to replace the fallen sycamores with a stronger tree, a better tree, the ancient Eres tree. They perform something in Hebrew called halaf. Halaf is to plant one tree in the place of another tree. And in this case, what they do is they plant a tree where the sycamores had fallen. And they basically are saying to God, you're not gonna humble us, you're not gonna make us repent, but we're coming back stronger like this new tree. And the tree that they plant in the place of the sycamore isn't a sycamore, that would have been the natural thing to do. But they put another tree because it's not about restoring things. It's about coming back stronger. So they plant a stronger tree where the sycamore had stood. The original Hebrew word translated as cedar in English is the Hebrew Erez. Erez can refer to a cedar, but also can mean a spruce. An Erez tree is one with needles and cones, a Pinocchio tree. The Erez tree symbolized ancient Israel's defiance. It stood as a tree of hope, but not hope in God, but themselves. For the seventh harbinger to manifest in America, the sign of the Eris tree would have to appear and be linked to 9-11. For that to happen, there'd have to be this almost ritual act of halaf, the replacing of one tree with another. Well, two years after 9-11, a tree appears in the sky. It appears at the corner of Ground Zero. It's being lowered into place to go into an exact spot of Earth where the sycamore of Ground Zero once stood and was struck down. The people are performing the act of halal. 
They are replacing the one tree with the other. It's a symbolic act. And they lower this tree to go into the exact spot of earth. And they have a ceremony around the tree. And they call it the tree of hope. So what kind of tree was it that replaced the sycamore? The tree that was lowered to the earth was not a sycamore, as would have been natural. The tree was a conifer tree. It was a tree with pines and needles. It was an evergreen tree. It was a panacea tree. In other words, the tree that was put in place was the Erez tree, the tree of Isaiah 9:10, the tree of judgment. So the seventh harbinger, as with all the rest, manifests in America, linked to 9-11, at the corner of Ground Zero, the Erez tree. The search to decode the eighth seal leads Noriel to the Lincoln Memorial, where on its steps, the prophet opens up the mystery of the eighth harbinger. The eighth harbinger is the utterance, the vow itself as spoken by a national leader. In ancient Israel, the people may have repeated this vow, we will rebuild, but it was only significant ultimately if a leader pronounce this vow, because only a leader can speak for a nation, and only a leader can set the course for the nation. So the leaders of ancient Israel pronounced the vow of defiance publicly from their capital, Samaria, and in doing so, they set the nation's course toward defiance and publicly pronounced judgment on the nation. For the eighth harbinger to manifest in America, the same vow of ancient Israel would have to be proclaimed by an American leader from the nation's capital and be linked to 9-11. What American leader in his or her right mind would actually pronounce judgment on America? Three years after 9-11. It's the anniversary of 9-11. It's September 11, 2004. An American leader gets up in the capital city to make a speech. It's a gathering, it's a congressional caucus that he's speaking to. The leader is John Edwards. He is prominent, he is a senator, and that year, that month, that day, he's running for vice president, so he is very known. Out of his mouth actually comes the ancient vow of judgment. Word for word, the ancient vow that was spoken by the ancient leaders of Israel that brought destruction on Israel is now coming out of the mouth of an American leader, word for word in the capital city. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dress stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. He has no idea what he's doing. He has no idea what he's saying. He thinks it's a good, encouraging word, but he's speaking judgment. Out of 30,000 verses in the Bible, he ends up speaking the verse that identifies a nation in danger of judgment. He speaks of the sycamores being cut down. He doesn't even realize that there is a literal sycamore that was struck down on 9-11. He's speaking symbolically. He doesn't realize it's real. He speaks of the cedars or the Erez tree. He says, we're gonna plant this. We're gonna, we're gonna plant the cedars where the sycamores fell. He doesn't realize it actually happened. He speaks of the stone or the Gazit stone that's going to go up. It's all manifested. And so amazingly, eerily, exactly, the eighth harbinger manifests on American soil as it did in ancient Israel before its destruction. The prophet leads Noriel to the western steps of Capitol Hill and there reveals to him the mystery of the Ninth Seal. The Ninth Harbinger is the prophecy. The vow becomes prophetic as it speaks of things yet to come and they come true. How could the Ninth Harbinger manifest in America? It would have to be an American leader to pronounce 
this vow of judgment, but it would have to be pronounced soon after the attack and actually set forth what was going to happen. It would have to become a matter of national record and it would have to come true. Did this happen? The amazing answer is yes. In fact, it was the very day after 9-11 when America and the world was traumatized. Most of us missed this. Something significant was happening on Capitol Hill. Something prophetic was happening. America was about to give its official response to the calamity. So this links up with ancient Israel in Isaiah 9:10. One man is chosen to give the response. And that man is the Senate majority leader. He's the representative of the Senate. The Senate represents the states and the nation. So he could speak for the nation. The man is Tom Daschle. He gets up to the podium on Capitol Hill the morning after 9-11 and gathered before him is the entire Senate and the entire House of Representatives in a joint session of Congress. He gets up to the podium and he delivers America's response to 9-11. There is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. He begins reciting the ancient vow of judgment on the floor of Congress on the very day after, as part of his presentation of America's response. He again doesn't realize what he's doing, but it is as prophetic. He says it, it becomes part of the annals of Congress. It is actually the rec in the record of Congress that America's response to 9-11, it was the exact words that were Israel's words in response to the first warning strike of judgment that happened over two and a half thousand years before. He speaks of the tree that was struck down. He doesn't even realize there's an actual tree that actually was struck down the day before and that's just being discovered that day. He speaks of the replacing of that tree with the Erez tree. He doesn't realize it, but it's gonna happen two years later after he says it. He speaks of the stone of judgment or the, the Gazit stone that it's gonna go up and it's gonna happen three years after he says it. And when he gets to the end of his speech, what he says is that he says, that is what we will do. We will rebuild and we will recover. What was he referring to? When he says that is what we will do, he was referring to Isaiah 9:10. In other words, even though he doesn't know what he's saying, he thinks it's encouraging, he doesn't know what he's saying, but what he says is, America will follow the course of ancient Israel, which was the course to national judgment. It sets the course that will determine the future of America and even the world. And it's going to lead to another shaking. The mystery of the harbinger reveals what happens next. If the nation does not heed the first shaking, there will come a second. And so it did. But this shaking didn't involve buildings, but American power itself. It would come as the collapse of the American economy, and behind this collapse would be another stream of ancient biblical mysteries. Some of these ancient mysteries were so precise that they would give the exact date and hours of that collapse. Since the Harbinger came out, Jonathan Kahn has been deluged with questions as to how he discovered the mysteries revealed in the book. How does a message like the Harbinger come about? I'm standing in New York City at the corner of Ground Zero, and my attention is being focused, drawn to an object. The object is the tree that was struck down. And something says, you have to seek this out. There's something there that you have to find. And I started seeking it out, and I was immediately led to Isaiah 9:10. It was the first puzzle piece of this biblical mystery that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then came the next puzzle piece. Then came the stone. Then came the 
the Erez tree and each thing. I didn't even know that this is the very verse that was proclaimed from Congress. It just came to me right away. And I was being led step by step. And every time I needed like the next key, someone would say something, the right word, or, or something would appear on the computer, something. I was led to find all these things. I take no credit for the message of the Harbinger. I was led step by step. And when it came to me, I was blown away by it. And when I first began to share the beginning of it with others, like at our congregation, everybody was blown away and said, this word has to go forth to the nation. This is a prophetic word. It's from God. It's got to go forth to the nation. A while later, I started writing. I've never written a book before in my life. And as I started writing this, it literally flowed onto the pages as if the book was already written, as if the book was writing itself. It happened rapidly. And so, again, I take no credit for any of it. Um, and, and I could not have come up with it, but that the Lord was leading that this would go forth and for such a time as this. The book reveals several mysteries behind what has happened and what is happening. And we'll just touch on some of them and then get more deep into one of them. One of the mysteries in the book is called the Isaiah 9:10 effect. The principle is this. When a nation is warned, if it doesn't heed the warning, but it responds in a way to try to undo the warning or tries to overcome it on its own strength without repentance, the actions it takes actually lead to another calamity. That is what happened with ancient Israel. As they tried to rebuild and they tried to come back stronger on their own strength and not with God and in defiance of God, they actually brought about their own calamity. And so one of the mysteries is that what America did in response to 9-11, in defying it, but without God, without turning back, it actually brought about the very collapse of the American economy years later. There's a mystery in the book called the uprooted or the buttonwood mystery. There's a principle. When shaking comes to a nation, when judgment comes, the foundations of that nation are revealed or exposed or the things that the nation trusts in or what it's built on. Well, on the day of America's rise to financial superpower, that foundational day, there was a sign that appeared that became a sign of America's prosperity, became a sign of Wall Street. On 9-11, that same sign that appeared on the foundation day of America's rise to financial superpower reappears, but in a different form, in a form that foreshadows not the rise of a great superpower, but the fall. There's another mystery, which in the book is called the third witness. And it comes from a biblical law that when judgment is to be pronounced on a person or a legal situation, even a nation, there's the principle of two or three witnesses. The Bible says there must be two or three witnesses affirming this, giving testimony that correlates with the others. Could there be two or three witnesses that have done this, that have pronounced the judgment concerning America? And the answer is yes. We've already touched on two of them. One that was made, that was done on Capitol Hill, another in the capital city three years later. But could there be a third witness? The Bible says two or three. And the answer is yes. And the third witness is none other than the President of the United States. And he will also bear witness and speak the words in the capital city before the nation. We don't have time to go into all of these, but we'll touch on one of the mysteries in the Harbinger called the Mystery of the Shemitah. Noriel is driving in his car in rural Pennsylvania, surrounded by fields of grain. 
something catches his eye. In the midst of one of the fields is the figure of a man. It's the prophet. There, in the midst of the grain, the prophet reveals to Noriel the ancient mystery of the Shemitah. There is a 3,000-year-old biblical mystery that goes back to the sands of Sinai, and yet which has determined the exact date and hours of the greatest financial collapse in American history. Every seven days in ancient Israel was a Sabbath day, a day of rest. But what people don't realize is that every seven years was a Sabbath year, a sabbatical. That's where we get it from. In Hebrew, the word is Shemitah. That was the Sabbath year. It was a year of rest. There was no sowing or reaping of the land. There was no buying or selling of the fruits of the land. It was an economic rest that covered the entire land. On the last day of the Shemitah, something interesting happens. On that last day, all the nation's debts are wiped out. All credit is wiped out. The nation's financial accounts are, in a sense, wiped clean. Now, this last day was called Elul 29, or the 29th day of the Hebrew month Elul. Elul 29, debts wiped out, credit wiped out, accounts wiped out. The Shemitah was meant to be a blessing. But when ancient Israel drove God out of its life, the Shemitah becomes a sign of judgment. So what does this have to do with America? America is not under the law of Moses, but the Shemitah is a sign of national judgment on such a nation. The key of the Shemitah is this seven-year mystery, this seven-year cycle. So when was the first shaking of America? The first shaking was 9-11. That was 2001. When was the second shaking? The collapse of the American economy happened in the year 2008. That's a seven-year cycle uh, between the two shakings. When in 2008 did this, this economic collapse happen? It happened in the month of September. That's seven years to the month of 9-11. When exactly? It happened the second week of September. That's seven years to the week of 9-11. And then it gets even more eerily exact. Because what was the greatest moment of that collapse. It happened at the end of September. It was September 29th, 2008. Wall Street collapses. That morning, they go to Wall Street to ring the opening bell, and the bell refuses to sound. Even Wall Street took it as an omen. That day is the greatest collapse in American history. Billions of dollars of the nation's financial accounts were wiped out in a single day. The greatest point crash in American history took place on the biblical day of the Shemitah. It happens on the exact 29th day of Elul. And even more mind-boggling, if you go back seven years from this crash, because it's a seven-year mystery, and it brings you to September 2001, that's the month of 9-11, but it's also the month of something else. That same month is the month of the other greatest crash in American history up to that day. It was actually caused by 9-11. It happened September 17, 2001. Now that's seven years within two weeks. But it gets even more eerie or amazing. Because if you strip away the Western calendar, what you're left with is that other greatest crash in American history took place on the exact same biblical day, the day of the Shemitah the day of Elul 29. The two greatest crashes in American history up to those days each happened on the exact same biblical day and happened on the exact day that just happens to be appointed to strike a nation's financial realm that is under judgment, that is driving God out of its life. Between the two crashes are seven biblical years down to the day, down to the hours. There's no one on earth who could have orchestrated all these things because every transaction, every investment in the world is part of this equation. Only the hand of God. And so the warning is that America's blessings, America's prosperity are from God. If America turns away from God, if America defies God, those blessings will be removed. The mystery.
how did the message of the Harbinger go forth? The story began with a Super Bowl, Super Bowl 42. It was called the greatest play in Super Bowl history. A man named David Tyree of the New York Giants. He jumps up in the air, gets the pass, pins it to his helmet in midair, and is tackled and it changes the game. What a lot of people don't know is David Tyree is a born again believer. Before he went into that Super Bowl, a man, a Christian, had given him a word and said to him that God was going to lift him up and that God was going to take him out of obscurity. He wasn't known. He was going to put him in the spotlight and it all happened. And he wrote a book about it and, and lifted up the Lord and mentioned this guy's name who gave him the prophecy. The Super Bowl catch would play a prophetic role in the release of the Harbinger message to the nation. Shortly after completing the manuscript for the book, Khan was traveling when a profound encounter occurred. When I just finished the book, I'm on a plane heading to Texas, to Dallas. And I'm um, in the airport, in Charlotte Airport, North Carolina, and I bow my head. It's the first chance I really have to just commit this all to God. I bow my head and I said, Lord, the harbinger is your message. You gave it to me. I didn't come up with it. This is for your purposes, not mine. Your glory, not mine. You have to get it out your way, not mine. And not by the hand of man, not by people's plans, but by your hand. You got out words in the Bible. You know how to do it to get a, a word of, a prophetic word of warning to a nation. You know how to do it now. So I trust this. I entrust it to you. I open up my eyes. There's a man sitting to my left. So I look over and I see the man. He has a book and he's like this. So I look over and I'm kind of looking like that. And I think he was reading Proverbs. So I was like, see, he's Jewish. <laughs> what have I got to say to him? So then I was like, do I really have to do this? I'm really tired. And I look again, and he actually went down in his seat like this. So I was like, oh, see, he's praying like this. So it's not going to make any sense. And so I just take off my headphones, I put my coffee down, and I turn to him, and I say, what's the good word? And I said, well, God loves you. That's the good word. And I went. Okay, I know that. <laughs> they were calling us for the flight, so it was time to get ready to get on. And right when we're ready to get up, I said, no, I have to do this. So I said, um, people are getting up and they're getting in line. And I said, uh, you can't get up yet, I have something to tell you. He turns to me, and, he's, and after speaking, he says, you have a book, God gave you a message. This book is going to spread, it's going to go forth, it's going to be published, it's going to go forth to America. It's from God, it's going to change things, it's going to change your life, it's going to change people's lives, it's going to happen. And he goes on and on. I start writing it down. It turns out that man was the same man who gave the word to David Tyree before the Super Bowl. And he wasn't supposed to be on that flight, but his flight kept getting canceled by the weather until he was put on my flight. And he sat down next to me just as I was praying. Because of that Super Bowl catch, only because of that, this man was mentioned in David Tyree's book, was put in touch with Stephen Strang of Charisma Publishers. After the airport encounter, he sent word to Charisma Publishers. I didn't do a thing. I didn't go to anybody with a harbinger. One day I get an email from Hubie. He said he sat next to this Jewish fellow at an airport and the man had a book that was going to change the nation. And he said it was going to be huge. And was I interested? And I wrote back and said, well, I need to know a little bit more than what you're telling me. Um, could I see a copy of the manuscript? But I said, the fact that you're interested in it makes me interested in it. And that is how the word of the Harbinger went forth to America, became a New York Times bestseller. It happened not by the hand of man, it happened by the hand of God. Noriel notices an almost hidden miniature image on one of the seals. It appears to be a building with a crown on it. His search through the nation's capital and back proves fruitless. One night, he has a dream. The dream will prove to be crucial in unlocking the secret of the mystery ground. While pondering all these things, the prophet appears and leads Noriel through the streets of Lower Manhattan. Noriel grows increasingly apprehensive as the two walk nearer and nearer to the mystery ground. Hidden in America's foundations is a mystery and a prophetic warning. A mystery uncovered in recent times and a warning coming true in our day. In ancient Israel, when judgment came, when the shaking came, the destruction came to the same ground where the nation was dedicated to God. 
For ancient Israel, it was the Temple Mount where King Solomon had dedicated the nation to God, prayed for its people, and warned of the consequences of turning from God. When the judgment finally came in 586 BC, the destruction returned to the same place, the Temple Mount. The nation's ground of consecration lay in ruins. Could the sign of the mystery ground, the destruction returning to a nation's ground of consecration, have anything to do with America? The answer lies at America's foundation, the day it became a fully constituted nation. The nation's first president, George Washington, and the newly elected Congress gather together in the infant nation's capital. Washington takes the first presidential oath of office. He placed his hand on a Bible, and then he spoke the first ever presidential words. And in that first ever presidential address, he issued a prophetic warning. It's embedded in our foundation. The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right, which heaven itself hath ordained. That is coming true in our day. We are witnessing two things. We're witnessing America departing from God, and we're witnessing the removal of the blessings. After issuing this prophetic warning, Washington and the nation's first Congress walk on foot to a place appointed for a specific act the very first act of the first fully formed American government. It was not to create a law or pass a bill. It was to pray, to consecrate the nation to God. This was America's consecration ground. It took place in the nation's capital. But the capital city that day on America's first day wasn't Washington, D.C. The capital city was New York City. Where? It was in Lower Manhattan. Where exactly? They went to pray and dedicate America to God on the first day on the place we know today as Ground Zero. Ground Zero is the dedication ground of America. The calamity returns to the same spot on where the nation was dedicated to God. And that ground, that same consecration ground, is the ground where the harbingers appeared. It was in that soil that the sycamore tree was growing and was struck down on America's consecration ground. It was that same ground where they performed that act of replacing the one tree with the other. That was the ground. It all happened. And all around Ground Zero, all the buildings are ruined or destroyed, except one. Only one is protected. And it was called the miracle of 9-11. What was that building? It was the little stone chapel where they dedicated America to God on the first day. And why was it protected? They said it was because there was an object that protected it, that absorbed the force of 9-11. What was the object? The object was the harbinger. It was the sixth harbinger, the sycamore. That sign, that striking down of the sycamore actually saved the place where America was dedicated to God. And the message here is that the point of the harbingers is not to condemn America to judgment, it's to wake America from judgment. It's to save. God would not warn unless he was seeking to save. And the other message with that same ground is that the voice of God is calling Return. Since The Harbinger was published in early 2012, many more signs have manifested in America. The Harbingers have continued. What is written in the book is coming true. There are things that I had no idea of when I wrote the book that came true afterwards and confirmed what was in the book. There was the visit that the President of the United States made to Ground Zero about six months after the Harbinger came out. And something prophetic took place that was a fulfillment of what's in the book, the Harbinger. There were words that were actually placed on a metal beam. And those words link back to the ancient mystery of Israel's destruction. There is the sign of the Erez tree. We spoke about it. But that sign has continued to manifest and has turned into an even more graphic sign of national judgment. There is even a revelation 
where God has actually joined together Isaiah 9:10 and 9:11 in the most dramatic way, a way that I had no idea of when I wrote the Harbinger, and actually revealed it, manifested it to millions of Americans without their even knowing it at the time. The mystery of the Harbinger continues. And the reason is, if the nation doesn't turn back to God, then the warnings continue, the progression continues, the mystery continues. They have and they will. What will the future be for America? The mystery of the Harbinger says that if we do not turn back to God, we will head to judgment. But will it be judgment that is the future or revival? And if it's judgment, how does judgment come? Judgment comes in the Bible in several different ways. It can come through the collapse of a nation's infrastructure, its economic collapse, its military collapse, military defeat. Judgment comes in the decline and fall of a nation. Judgment can come with natural disasters, disasters of nature or man-made disasters as in terrorism. Judgment comes with division in the society. If America does not turn back to God, its blessings cannot continue as they have continued. That is a biblical principle. But the question is, will America turn? Will there be judgment or revival? And I'm led to answer often that there can be both. There can be judgment and revival. That sometimes revival only comes through judgment or shaking. If there was no hope, there'd be no harbingers. What's the point of harbingers? What's the point of warning if there's no hope of responding? What's the point of a, an alarm clock if there's no possibility of hearing it? So there is hope, but that hope is very specific and has to do with God's people. The Harbinger is not only a revealing of ancient mysteries and a message to America, it is also a call to each person who hears it. In a chapter called Eternity, the prophet begins to share with Noriel the last and most ultimate of issues, life, death, what comes after, and what comes forever. People ask, how can I be safe in times of judgment? Where is there safety? Where should I move to? Should I build a bomb shelter? Well, the answer is, in Hebrew, the word for safety is Yeshua. And Yeshua is the name of Jesus. His real name is Yeshua. Safety or salvation. Outside of him, there is no safety. Inside of him, there needs to be no fear. The key thing is, if you are not in Yeshua, get your life into Yeshua. He said you must be born again. And that is the simple act of saying yes to God with all your heart. God so loved you that he gave his own life in Messiah to die for your sins and to rise again, to overcome, that whosoever would be saved. And so he calls to you now and says, Come to me, you who are weary, burdened down. Come, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you life, and I will not turn you away. The time is late, and it's getting darker. But what the Bible says is the hope is with God's people. God gave Solomon an answer to his prayer, the prayer that he prayed that day on the Temple Mount on that ground. That speaks to us now. It was about Israel, but the principle applies. And he said to Solomon this. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And the key is that revival doesn't begin with Washington, D.C. It doesn't begin with Hollywood. Salvation doesn't happen that way. Revival begins with the people of God. The key is, if my people. See, as the dark gets darker, the lights have to get brighter. 
One of the mysteries of the end times is that it's not just a time of darkness. It's a time of polarization. The dark gets darker, but the lights have to get more radical and bright for God. It is time to shine for God. If you're ever going to live all out for God, now is the time to do it. The voice of God is calling. And he says in Hebrew, Kumi ori kiva orech, arise and shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. It is written that the eyes of the Lord search throughout the entire earth to find the one whose heart is completely his and he will lift that one up. You be that one. You be that person because the call is on you. You are to be the watchman, the watchwoman. You are to be the ones who set the trumpet to your mouths and blow. Sound forth the warning, spread the gospel, spread the light of God. The key word, if my people who are called by my name, that's you, will humble themselves, that's you, and seek my face, that is you, and turn from their evil ways, that's you. I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I will heal their land, your land. The key phrase, if my people, the key word, if.